welcome to episode number 28 of The Witching Hour. As always, I must welcome my wonderful co-host, Haley Fouch. Hello. And then this is another special show because we have a guest that I think is wonderful and he made a great first feature. It is Lee Cronin, the director of The Hole in the Ground. Hello, hello. I'm welcome. scared to look at the camera, so I'm just going to wave at you guys over here. Hi. They're not Hi. here. Hello, everybody. It's yeah. so nice to see you again. Absolutely. Have you survived and recovered um, from the whirlwind that is Sundance? Just about. I feel like when I look in the mirror, I feel like I'm a ghost version of myself, like <laughs> paler than I usually am as an Irishman, um, but that's probably not been helped by the rain in LA when I arrived here, which has really sucked, actually. That Come was, to LA, the weather's amazing. It's a lie. Um, no, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's just... Well, you especially need that lie to not be a lie when you're coming back from a place like Park City, where we actually had really weather good weather in, in Park, Park City, City than but... it has been in Los Angeles. Yeah. It was freezing. <laughs> yeah. It was freezing. No, it wasn't too bad. I could have my jacket open most of the time. It's oh, fine. that's push from, That's pushing it for me, but I come it from was wind Swept Island, so you know. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Um, did Hole in the Ground premiere at the library? No, it was the Egyptian. The where we Egyptian. Had, yeah, we started in the Egyptian and then we ended in the library. I nice. wasn't there for the final screening. So actually, our biggest audience was a midnighter in the library on the f the second Friday. So we we premiered on the first Friday in the Egyptian, and then we had we played a couple of other venues in between, which was great. The second screening was really nice, which was in the temple. Which is, I never went to the temple. Yeah, like so, it's like it's a synagogue, and it was it was a really local audience. The first screening, the Egyptian, as wonderful as it was, it's quite industry heavy because a lot of people wanted to see the movie. But then there was like just real cinema goers at the second, and like everybody stuck around for the Q and A afterwards and asked really smart questions about the movie. So it was really it's like okay, it's like local people getting up at noon to kind of watch. Well, getting up, maybe they were up early, shoveling snow before they got to the place. But yeah, it was really exciting. The venues there are amazing. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite, a, quite a spectacular The place. venues there, and we talk about this often because both of us go to a ton of film festivals, but when you go to a festival like that and, you know, you spend all day seeing great movies with a whole bunch of wonder, wonderful people, then you go to the midnight one, mm -hmm. and there's, there's a different energy in that theater. And yeah. People are vocal in a very, very different way. And every single time I see a premiere screening of a horror movie at a film festival, I always try to take that in. Yeah, the, the atmosphere on the first night in The Egyptian was like when you do stand up to present the film and you realize it's the first Friday in Sundance, it's your first movie, it's in The Egyptian, it's at midnight. You, you kind of wonder, could it get any better than that as a launch pad for your film? And yeah, the audience, I've been kind of warned, you know, midnight audiences can be a little bit vocal. And they were at times, but also I shut them the hell up with my tension by time as well. You know, <laughs> people were kind of glued. But also, yeah, there was some audible reactions, which is really great to hear. You don't necessarily get that in, in a regular screening. So a lot of our viewers, this of course is your first feature, as you, yeah. as you said, they don't know who you are. So can you give us a little bit of a background? Also, because we were talking before we started rolling and sure. it, you are, you're a horror fan. You're definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. a horror fan. I kind of pretend I'm not sometimes, but no, I am, but I am a horror fan. Why, can... why filmmaking? And then what was it that linked you to the horror genre specifically? I think it was the, it was the early influence, really. I'm the youngest in my family by like, I think it's nine years between me and my sister. There's, you know, a, a late lamb is the nice way of saying that. There is worse ways of saying, but I'm, I'm a late lamb. And <laughs> I was exposed to, to horror at a really young age. So by eight, nine, I'd seen The Shining, I'd seen Evil Dead, I'd seen Evil Dead 2, I'd seen Jaws was my favorite movie from that age, I was a big Ghostbusters fan, I'd seen Poltergeist, you know, and those early influences and impact, like, there's no shaking it really. So despite the fact that a lot of my cinematic, I so almost say like my appetizer was horror when it came to my cinematic education. And I've gone on and, you know, there's lots of other genres that I'm into, but there's no escaping the films that kind of shaped my mind, which, gave me the tools to look at dread and tension and how to play with fear and you know it'll always be part of what I do I think I could never see me just doing a straight up drama or a rom-com and I've written some of those things but I think when it actually comes to the crunch it's those experiences I had as a kid and how I can kind of project them as a grown-up back onto people that's where the influence came from and I think say to take something like Jaws like I will never forget the moment I saw Ben Gardner's head come out of the boat hole like to this I can actually remember going to the bathroom afterwards as like an eight-year-old kid and being terrified of the water that, was, <laughs> that existed in the bathroom. And there's no shaking that moment for me. First time I was ever scared of humans or thought the world was scary. You said that you're not specifically a huge fan of contemporary horror though. Like what's the cutoff for you? No, there's no cutoff. I just kind of find it, it doesn't attract me in the same way at times. And maybe like there's lots of look, don't get me wrong, there's lots of amazing stuff out there, but I tend to find myself struggling with maybe some of the more modern franchises. They just maybe just part of growing up they don't get under my skin in the same way like when i watch a horror movie i like to be scared first before i'm even entertained so even if it's not 
the greatest story in the world. If it gets under my skin, I'm kind of more interested. But I would say the last film that truly, probably Paranormal Activity. Oh, I'd say I'm not that, alone. Yeah, I'd say that, like, I struggle to watch the last five minutes of that. Like, the, you know, the first one, really, stuff like that, because it, the, the domestic aspect of that story, it's something I'm interested in, it really gets to me. And there's that, you know, that moment where they find the picture of her old house that had burnt down. And at that point, I was like, oh no, I'm really, really uncomfortable now. Because <laughs> I come from Ireland and we're a little bit, you know, I don't think I believe in ghosts, but you know, there's a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit of an attitude around that stuff that spooks me out. So wait, what is the Ireland vibe in terms of horror movies? So it's generally not embraced as much as it is here in the States? I think it is. I think there's a massive audience there, but I think your general cinema goer in Ireland can sometimes be a little bit scared to go. I think sometimes the word horror, particularly in an Irish context when I talk to people, they assume that means blood and guts. You know what I mean? And knives and garroting. You know, like, it's, it's, it's not... And that's not the case. So a lot of people I talked about in my movie go, oh, no, I don't watch horror. But then I explain, actually, it's a psychological thriller with a lot of horror notes and a lot of horror beats, and then they become more interested. We have that conversation. We talk all, about like, it constantly. We are constantly <laughs> debating the definition of horror, yeah. and then oftentimes I certainly find myself removing the word horror because I don't want to box it in, sure. and I don't want to deter someone from exploring a new movie. So instead, I'm like, a genre movie. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. What, whatever that means. And that still doesn't make much logical sense and to me. And then there's all but... those buzzwords like elevated horror or prestige horror right. or whatever that whatever that so like does it soften the H is it done with a small H then I think it's so it, people like the ones you're talking about who are like I don't watch horror well maybe I watch elevated horror yeah. I don't know but it's funny I don't watch horror but then they list a lot of horror movies that they do watch or right. like you know so it's yeah but I'm hoping you know with the hole in the ground that we're going to really kick open a door back home like the home audience matters you know to me um, and it's phenomenal the response that we're having with the film here in the US and in other countries. But I'm really excited to premiere the film to, to Irish audiences and hopefully kind of convert them. When does it open there? First of March, same as here. Actually. Oh, great. Mar March 1st here in the UK and in Ireland, yeah. What was it like figuring out the distribution for this? Because you can correct me if I'm wrong. Going into Sundance, you were already linked up with A24, which yeah. had the direct TV yeah. arrangement. So yeah. you knew yeah. your film was going to get out there. I knew for quite a while. It was wow. actually new since October 2017. I don't know if I'm allowed to say Ooh. that. But yeah, I knew for like for quite a while. But so A24 saw a three-minute promo of the film and acquired huh. it at that point. So we were still deep in post-production at that stage. So wait, you make a three-minute promo. How how do you decide that that's the way to do it? And then how do you get that promo into a company like A24? Truthfully, it was out of my hands. It, like we have a brilliant sales agent, and they wanted to bring the film to AFM wow. to, to try and start to try and start selling it early. So they actually, I was I I just finished a, a bank of editing, and I took a break and I went to New York for a week, and I came back and they were like, "Here's a sales promo," and I was really confused by it because I was like, "Is this the film? You're still finding the movie exactly? Is this the film I'm making?" And then you trust the people you're working with. And then you get a phone call a couple of weeks later and they're like, oh yeah, A24 want the movie. Um, so they read the screenplay and they looked at, at a three minute promo and then they became collaborators in, into the finishing line, you know, as we finished the film and they kind of showed support in, uh, in how we'd go about doing that. So it was, yeah, it's like, they're great people to be working with and they've got a great track record. So at that, genre. Yeah, yeah, of <laughs> at that time, like October 2017, were you already very much aware of their sort of, you know, reputation in the oh, horror to field? To totally. I remember sitting down with a buddy of mine from New York who lives in Ireland and we were sitting in a bar before, about a year before I made the film and he said, could you imagine like A24 pick up your movie? And then he was kind of one of the first people I rang and then we went and had a beer and talked about it. So <laughs> yeah, like they were, you know, you don't set out to make a movie for anybody specifically. You just try and make the best movie that you can. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it was a really good fit, you know. Well, some make, some go out to make a specific movie for a specific crowd or a specific company, and then oftentimes that yeah. blows up in your face. That might not work, yeah. So <laughs> I think you've got to just put your best foot forward. I think the one thing I do always look at, I think the word I use most when I'm in an edit suite is audience, because I get my kicks out of the process. I get my kicks out of all the little secrets and the twists and the turns, and the, people don't see the brush strokes really in the creation. And, but for me, like my motivation as a filmmaker is to put people in a dark room and move their asses closer to the edge of the seat. Like that's the goal, plain and simple. So yeah, and like if you work with A24, whatever methods they put the film out there with, you know they're gonna re reach a wide audience. So it's like really great to work with them. So going to the idea for the hole in the ground a little mm. now, what was it about a mysterious sinkhole that kind of drew you in? I think it, because it, could re it can represent everybody's fears. 
because it's a dark void, you know, it's like the unknown future. You know, that was the metaphor that I kind of looked at it as. And also I'd read a news story about a, I think we talked about this a little bit before, I read yeah. a news story about a guy in Florida who was like sitting in a chair watching TV and a sinkhole opened up beneath him and he was gone and they couldn't get him out. And it's like, that's a terrifying concept. So I, I did at one point, I was developing this idea, it was just about people getting taken, just like, you know, the world, like opening up beneath their feet and being taken. But I was also at the same time working on this mother-son relationship and I was reflecting on some people I knew in my life and the situations that they were in. And I always try and bring a little bit of my own personal experience. And I just felt that the sinkhole was a really interesting kind of object in the center of this story that could bounce against this mother and son and their unknown future and their dark past and, you know, the monsters that might be behind them or in front of them. And it just, yeah, it was cinematic, you know, it's, it's quite a cinematic thing, but it was hard to make it work because it is in, in a lot of ways an inanimate object. It's just a big, a big void. So we needed to give a personality and a voice and a sense of movement and kind of motion. So the, de the development of the sinkhole itself visually at the center of the story was probably one of the most challenging things of all. And it's not in the movie a lot. It's, it's not there a whole lot. It's just, it's lurking in the background all the time. It's your jaws. Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, you do get to see it. It's but. my Beetlejuice. Uh, but yeah, it's like, <laughs> he's like 16 minutes or something in the movie. I don't think we're probably like even less, two minutes or something. But yeah, it's, I, 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 I'm only realizing this now, but I'm kind of drawn to stories that have this object at the center of them, like my short film Ghost Train, or I'm working on another project called Box of Bones at the moment, which has this box of human remains at the center of the story. But it's just sitting there while everything else happens around it. In a you hold ways. on to that title. Like the second box you said bones. box of bones, I'm like, oh, okay. I, I could hear anything after that and I would be sold. Yeah, yeah. What's inside the box of bones? You know? <laughs> I am fascinated by that. Um, also, I wanted, we talked a little bit about this at Sundance, but I want to involve Haley in this conversation because one of my favorite qualities in your movie are your two lead performers mm -hmm. because it's cool to go into a movie with a catchy concept like having a massive sinkhole in your backyard and sure. how that has an effect on, on a mother-son relationship, but it's the chemistry between the two of, of them, how it pops off the screen. That's what gives that concept so much life. Sure. So can you talk about matching the two of them together? Yeah, like bringing them together. Like, first of all, it's great that people are, whether people love or hate the movie, I keep on saying this, I don't think you can deny the quality of the performances mm -hmm. that are there. The two actors are great, as are the support cast, although they've less to do in the story, because it's a very- I'm a big fan of Owens too. Yeah, so I was I'll, glad to see I'll him pop up hello, in this. A friend of mine. Um, but it's, yeah, it's like, um, I think the process, with, with, it started with Shauna who plays Sarah in the film. She, she wasn't on my radar. I've told her this at, at all. I was looking at the more traditional horror mother it was kind of, she was kind of older and kind of chain smoking and, you know, it's just where my brain was. And it was actually my producer, John Kevill, I have to take my hat off to him that said, watch Shauna in this movie, A Day for Mad Mary. And I watched the movie and I rang John and said, let's stop talking to everybody else. Get me a meeting with her. There's no need, I'm not, didn't want need to do like an audition. I just saw something unique in her that could elevate the character that I was trying to write. And it brought the character down in age for her, met her a few times, absorbed her personality, rewrote the script for her again a little bit gave it kind of this like Shauna pass and then we had to go and look for the kid like who her son was going to be and I remember asking asking Shauna I was like what's your what's your biggest fear before we made the film and she was like the fact that I'm going to be relying on an eight-year-old actor <laughs> so like when you're in a scene if you're stuck in the trenches in a scene and it's not working you know you've got another grown-up to maybe age you if you've got like an eight-year-old kid that's not giving you what you need or not understanding the concept of even just a scene or a moment that was her biggest fear and then you go and look, you know what I mean? And it's like, you go out and you have a casting agent and they they bring a lot of different, you know, propositions to you and different kind of styles of kid and the way they'll work. And we looked a lot and actually in truth, James who plays Chris and, and another boy who became the final two, weren't even on the kind of short lists that were presented to me. So I went kind of digging, digging in the buckets to see who else was there. And there was something about them that stood out and it was James versus another kid that was more obviously creepy. And again, my insecurity was leading me towards that other kid all the way, where it's like, yeah, I need a creepy kid. But actually what I realized, the more I got to know James, was what I need is a normal kid that can just, as excuse me, say, take one tick on the clock to the right that just makes him offbeat at that mm. point. And then we put them together in a room and you know, we worked some chemistry tests and we did some like mother and son kind of like days and hung out a little bit and had lunch together and they developed their own shorthand. Um, and then honestly, with an eight-year-old kid on set, you just cross your fingers. <laughs> you know, at that point, you've done all you can. You talk to their parents, you talk to them. But this kid, like, he's, he's a little superstar. Like, he's, and he's also completely not precocious at all. He's 
really gentle. He's really down to earth, really respectful. I remember the end of the first week, I went up to him and I said, I was like, listen, dude, you're doing really well. Like, fair play, thanks for everything. And as I walked away, he grabbed me by the hand and pulled me real close and said, no, thank you. He's just oh like the God. sweetest kid in the world. <laughs> you know, um, but I think he hates me because I made him eat a lot of spaghetti bolognese in the film, which is his least favorite food in the world. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, that kept him on his toes. We play a game on Collider called Would You Rather? And one of my favorite questions is something like, uh, would you rather have to eat in a scene or run in a scene? Because very few people out there really think, yeah. stop and think, oh, if you're eating or running, you are doing that maybe 20 times over if someone yeah. wants to do a lot of takes. Yeah, and actually both of the actors in my film had to eat and run and it's tricky because you know you've got marks to hit and it's some of the eating there's some intense short eating shots in the hole in the ground and you know the the, the field of focus was so so shallow that like the kid had to eat spaghetti but like he couldn't move like you know a centimeter can you guys understand centimeters in america you don't need to say half an inch or whatever <laughs> centimeter works i'm a metric system guy <laughs> but yeah it's like yeah he could, he could barely barely move uh, at all which is really really just so it's like you got to eat you got to eat something that you don't like and also by the way stay completely still while you're doing it. So yeah, it's challenging. You said you sort of gave it a Shauna pass on the script. Yeah. Did that process have any sort of like butterfly effect fallout on the larger story or was it really focused in on her character? I think it did. I think for me, and whether it shines through or not, I'm not sure, but I remember thinking there's a difference between a younger mother and a more experienced mother. And the fact that I didn't want Shauna to play up or down in age, I wanted her to kind of play herself. So in my own brain, maybe even just how I then approached directing her, I was always aware that she was a less experienced mother in the world, this bigger universe or whatever story that I'm telling. And I think that did have a little bit of an impact in places in terms of how we kind of crafted her character. And I think then as well with Shauna's personality, she's, she's brilliant at um, you know, expressing her internal emotion, uh, which, which is really great. And we decided quite early on that you know, we'd lean into that a little bit and we'd use that and that her, we have a backstory for her character and there's obviously, there's a hint of a dark, potentially abusive past, you know, before we enter the story and it was something we said, right, you can't scream in this film because, because of your past, you've, got, you've done all your screaming. You, you know that screaming out loud gets you nowhere, which was a really difficult challenge for both of us because there's times when you're in the trenches that you think, maybe if I just got her to like lose her head right now and scream her head off and like get us through this moment and onwards, but we had to keep restraint all the time. And that's, that's a real challenge for an actor and it's a real challenge for a filmmaker as well when you're almost leaving certain horror tools behind. I remember said, there's, you're not gonna be a scream queen in the traditional way. You're gonna be a more quiet, thoughtful version of that character. It's interesting thinking about that because I feel like something like that should have stuck out like a sore thumb, but I didn't even realize it until you just said it right now. Yeah. Despite the things she faces, she never, you know, she raises her voice once at the, let's just say the, the, the scary element of the story mm -hmm. without ruining anything. She does raise her voice, but it was all very much controlled. And these are things when you're making a movie you, you can have doubts about. Like you make a decision and then you wonder is it the right thing to do. But it felt right. It felt right for her personality. It also felt right for the character. If you've come from an abusive place, maybe you've, you know, you've had to adapt to be a very quiet person, mm. um, which is why she doesn't scream and shout. Hmm. That's so interesting. I'm still shocked. That just crossed my mind now. Yeah, you Did, you, I know. Yeah. Did I've you got have no to... problem with that. Because <laughs> also, with what you said earlier about you know little details, it's I imagine. Full of yeah. Details. I think right. my, my favorite one is again. It's a little element in the story. No one would notice that in the epilogue of the story, when Sarah is walking along with her kid, if you look at the, it, just reminded me of your necklace caught the light there. She's mm -hmm. actually wearing a tiny mirror that we gave her. Mm -hmm. Like her, so, if you dig really deep, there huh. are. There's probably 50 of those kind of things in the story that you know would make for good trivia. I don't know if they make it a better movie, but they make for good trivia. Well, we have a show here called Schmodown. They should sure. put a, we need a, another horror one. There you, yeah. go. Need, you know what it needs to be? Mm. It needs to be a horror slice on the wheel, but specifically A24 horror. That seems hey. like a worthy topic there, no? I agree. Okay. I agree. Yeah, I take think. it to Christian. All right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. When you take something out of the equation, like that kind of expressive vocal quality and screaming, do you have to sub in another technique to sort of rile up the feelings that would give the audience? Yeah, I think you just have to rely on the actual the strengths of your actor to deliver the nuance in a lot of ways. Like, again, something me and Shauna spoke about and I told her was whenever it, it, we hit a really tricky time with the schedule or whatever, I'd be like, I had to drop some shots or drop some setups. I'd be like, Sean, I'm just gonna put the camera on you. We're gonna talk about what I need you to do and we're gonna talk about the character and what you need to kind of bring out. But I think, I think not that it changes, because you may, 
to go back to your question, I think you make the decision up front and it just becomes part of the tapestry of how you're doing it. So it's not like you're subbing anything in at a time going, this is where you should screen, but now you're going to do it this way. I think we already kind of had it figured out that that was the way it would be. I do remember one short pickup scene we had to do because some months had gone by. We had to really remind ourselves of that kind of control and restraint that needed to be performed. But at, at the time, it felt natural. We were talking a little bit about this earlier, but I'm curious about your experience working as a first time feature from a creativity perspective mm -hmm. on this versus, let's say, a bigger high budget studio sure. film. So what was that kind of like for you? Was I mean, are you able to just purely make your own movie or and I don't mean this like it's a bad thing to even be doing this, but are you thinking, you know, this is kind of what's going to be the launching point for my career overall? Yeah, you're aware. You're very aware, and I think I had opportunities before I made this film to direct other projects from other scripts, but you only have one opportunity to make your debut. And it's kind of, I think it's, it's actually really tough on you know, contemporary filmmakers. If you look back at some of the greatest filmmakers of all time, they got to go make like a Roger Corman movie, or they made maybe t some TV movies, and they, maybe they're four or five movies in before people actually even paid attention to them. And nowadays, you know, information spreads so fast. If you just like make something and it's not good enough, you're labeled like very, very quickly. So you are aware, but I think you also just have to try and tell your own story your own way. And uh, like, I'm very lucky the people that I work with, I've been surrounded by for a while. So they just trusted me to go and do the job. We talked about it for long enough. We all felt ready to make the film the way we wanted to make it. And, and we kept taking risks. Like I think, like an in, again, kind of an interesting, or I find an interesting element of the production was how I wanted quality over quantity at all times. So there's very little coverage in the film at all. And I think the longest assembly, which is where you put everything in, is like 98 minutes long. Wow. And the film is 90 minutes. So we tailored it and designed it. And I was like, I am going to gamble. So if this doesn't work, if this, there's a number of scenes in the film that are just like a single shot that might be a minute and 30 long, you know, maybe a minute and 40 long. Um, and it either works or it doesn't. So I guess we're not getting a lot of deleted scenes. There is, I think we dropped, there's like one, there's one scene okay. that, that didn't make it. And I think there was also a wistful moment where she kind of like looked out a window and moved a curtain and I was like, this isn't an art movie. So it didn't, <laughs> it didn't make it. Going from Ghost Train, which you know I love, to this, was there any part of the feature directing process that when you stepped on set for this one, you're like, oh, like that's how that worked. Or I didn't expect it to feel like this. Mm, I'm trying to think. I guess there is lots, I, do you know, the, the system is stronger around you, so it's actually a pleasant surprise because you're always stretched on a short, and this is still a low budget feature film, you're stretched, but I think you have more time even to just pick some of the key crew around you and get to know their personalities, and the difference is you get proper prep time. With a short, it's really seat of the pants, and whereas this is like, you know, we had four or five weeks official prep where you're working with your assistant director, you're working with your locations manager, you're working with your design team. So by the time you set on set, step on set, you've all got a, a greater shorthand. It's like you get more time to limber up before. So actually, it was a lot of positive things in terms of how you step in. The schedule is tough, though, you know. And we like it's you know as low budget debut features go, it still had like a healthy amount of money behind it. But it's like it's really tight, and I think less for me because I'd such you know I had a grip on the story for a long time. For again, for the actors, for someone like Shauna, I think one of the biggest challenges she would have faced on set that's different to a short would be having to go through so many different emotional spaces in one day, because the schedule actually dictates. I would have loved to shoot this, shot the movie in like a linear fashion. The schedule dictates where you place. So I'll say to Shauna, oh, you're happy now, but in an hour you're gonna be covered in dirt, soaking wet, and you're gonna be at your most, you know, your weakest point or your most dramatic high point or whatever it might be. Oh, and then when we're finished doing that, you're gonna get cleaned up again in a cold shower, no doubt, and you're gonna to have to go back and be like normal again. So that's a, real, that's a real challenge on a feature is the, I suppose, the expanse of that 90 or 100 minute story condensed into a 20 or 24 day shoot, all those places that you have to go. And I suppose that's one of the most taxing things as a filmmaker is I have to be the one that is, has a grip on every one of those changes so I can just help place somebody where I need them to be. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned that you sort of, when you were in the casting process, almost leaned towards the more obviously sure. creepy kid. Yeah. Is the creepy kid subgenre of horror one that you like, and did you find in making the film that you had to resist certain tropes? I didn't realize I'd made a creepy kid film until afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> in truth, it was, I just saw it as a mother and son story is actually wh what my motivation was. And maybe that's why it's been elevated and people have really responded to it, because I didn't go out to just make a creepy, creepy kid story. You know, I also see the, the, the I, like, if you dig a little into the mythology and the story, I, I have a certain sympathy for, for Chris's character, 
you know, in the situation that he's in, if he's from another place and his want and need to just be human and accepted in a lot of ways, despite the kind of, uh, I suppose, darker means around that. But, um, yeah, like, you know, I really love The Omen and... It's funny, there's some Six Sense comparisons, which is a wonderful thing to hear, but like, I was going, well, Six Sense isn't a creepy kid movie. It's a, it's a kid to feel sorry for movie, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, so yeah, I, I tr truthfully didn't. And I think once the film was made and people started to look at the marketing and they were pushing the creepy kid thing, I was actually kind of a little bit reticent to get behind that. But then you have to just look at what you've made and you're like, you know what? there's a damn creepy kid in this film, so let's, I'm going to put my shoulder behind it and let's go. That's the thing, though, and I feel like we've been talking about this often. I mean, it's a, a stupid, simplified version of what I'm actually trying to get at, but I keep looking at recent horror movies as, like, Horror Plus, where they'll give you, like, a very familiar logline that they know will draw people in, but it just seems like so many movies that we're getting recently actually take the time to have well-developed characters sure. to then support that immediate draw, yeah. and... Yeah. It is so nice to see that now. It's great. It's actually really great. Like, I think if you look, I'm trying to think, like, like well, Hereditary is a beautiful example, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like, that's a film about, you know, grief, a family's grief. And that allowed, that's the platform then to, to play the games of the genre with the audience, you know? And I think we tried to achieve with The Hole in the Ground as well. Was, you know, it's a story about trauma from the past and how it can affect your future. I think if you underpin it with identifiable emotions, things that people can identify with. So I don't think you have to have kids to be scared by the situation in the hole in the ground. But I think everybody in life has had a relationship with somebody where they know them in every possible way, they know them in depth. And it could be an argument. Do you ever have that moment where you have an argument with someone and you see a twitch in their eye you've never seen before? And for a split second, you're like, oh my God, do I actually know who you are? <laughs> to me, they're some of the most terrifying moments in life. So I'll always dig into that domestic fear and try and use it. There were so many movies at Sundance, like now that you put it that way, and I'm all of a sudden going through my list, I'm like, oh, they, it wasn't horror, but it had that same quality yeah, to maybe it. Maybe the world is having an identity crisis at the moment. You know, maybe that's a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your experience was like at Sundance on this interview circuit. Yeah. Was there anything about that whole process that really kind of took you by surprise? You're completely unprepped for it in a, in a way because you've never done it before. So it's, it's all a little bit of a surprise and you walk into these different rooms. There was some good like swag to steal. That was, that was, like, that was a bonus. <laughs> I hope you got a pair of boots and some life water. You know, I got, I got, an, I got some nice luggage. Uh, I think I got one of those DNA ancestry kits as well. You know, you get some cool so stuff. Random. But no, it, it, in truth, it was, you don't know what to expect because when your film plays, you don't know how it's going to play. So not that you fear that press round that you've got to do, but you, you just don't really know how it's going to be. You start having these conversations in your head about like, am I going to have to sit in a room with somebody that hates this film? Yeah, and so it's a little bit nerve-wracking, but everybody was very positive, and it's all set up in a really professional way as well. You're just kind of, you're rolled from one room to the next, and you say what you got to say. And I think you, you, the first one we did was myself and, and, and James and Shauna, and we were kind of like slightly unsure, and we had to do like some pieces to camera to kind of promote the film. Huh. And, you know, Irish people aren't really into that. <laughs> so, yeah, we had to put on our shitty little grins. Oh, that's interesting. It was fun, though. A lot of How fun. does it uh, compare to, you know, everybody, I think, does fake interviews in their head? They do, don't they? Yeah. In the bath. <laughs> we um, all do it. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm reasonably confident at talking, so I guess, and I talk to myself a lot in my head, so it kind of felt, no, it kind of felt normal a little <laughs> nice. bit to me. But I think what's nice is when people, and most people had, like, questions that actually are, you know, drilling into the what the film is actually about. It's the same with the Q and A's is really nice and you get people wanting to know about backstory and theme rather than like how'd you make the sinkhole? And people that's a cool question too, but you want people to actually dig in a little bit deeper. Did you get any kind of really out of left field QA questions? There was one at the premiere which I, it was so left fieldish <laughs> that I kinda can't rebuild it in my mind, but it was something to do with was it a comment on modernity and something, something, something. And I just politically crawled my way out of that question. I talked, <laughs> talked about something else. It's an artful thing to be able to do. Yeah. And, and probably, especially as you make more movies, which yeah. you should, yeah. that is a skill that you need to have. What is it like now that the movie has premiered and it has gotten a very warm, welcoming response to picture your movie in the catalog of A24 horror movies? Because we talk yeah. about A24 <laughs> sure. specifically with sure. horror nonstop. And yeah. it is a very great group of films to be a part of. I think very simply, it's, it's nice to be part of that freakish family. Like, I'm really happy with like our poster even. It feels like it fits in with, with that kind of A24 universe. And, but equally, what's great about A24 horror is each film is, is quite different to each other. I, probably the common thread between them is the strong characters and the, the mm -hmm. underpinning of emotion that exists. But yeah, it's, it's like, what more can I say than it's, it's great to be kind of part of that stable, you know?
Other than your own, do you have a favorite A24 horror movie? My own probably isn't my favorite. <laughs> I actually, it's not a horror though. My favorite, well, it, 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 it's not, but a ghost story actually would be. Oh. Because I just didn't expect such a big idea and such a small canvas. It's like emotional horror. It really is, yeah. yeah. And it, like, I remember I'd had a really busy week and I just lay down on the floor and put it on with really low expectations and watched it on a big screen at home. And by the end of watching it, I was like, I was just sitting on the floor, kind of mesmerized by the scale of the idea within it. But I think what I like about all of A24's horror is every time I watch it, I get something more from it. That's the thing that I've really enjoyed. Like when I went to see The Witch for the first time, I was a tiny bit bamboozled because I didn't know what to expect. And I, I kind of walked out and I was like, I don't know how I feel about this film. Then I went back and I was like, God damn, I love this film, you know? So there's, there's a lot of layers to peel back within the stuff that they release. And I think it's always a little bit left field what they do as well. So yeah, I'd like so far I've actually liked it. I'm not, I'm not just trying to be political and be like, oh yeah, say the nice thing. There's something to really enjoy about all of their horror releases. No, so that's far. for sure. When, when we like, bring it up, we bring it I, up genuinely. I love The Black Coat's Daughter. I love that movie. I really love The Black Coat's Daughter. I think I need to re-watch that one because I only saw it when it debuted at TIFF, something like a year before its release when it was called February. February. It's yeah. called February actually in Ireland. And in Is Europe, it really? It's called February, yeah. Okay. I, I'm a big fan of that cast. It didn't really work well for me at TIFF, but I hear that I need to revisit it. Just the atmosphere was great. And I, like, I'm the easiest viewer in the world. I'm really dumb when I watch movies, so I <laughs> didn't get any sense of the construct in that movie or what the surprises were or how the timelines were working. Mm. I just kind of sit there and, like, eat my popcorn and just, you know, just, just, just get involved. So I was really, really surprised by that. That's hey, what's your favorite A24 horror movie? I don't uh, think we've ever had this conversation. It has to be hereditary. That, I think that's what I would have guessed. Yeah, I, don't, I do love The Black Coat Daughter, and I think about it a lot. It's an ending that yeah. it just pops into my head yeah. randomly. It's really great. you like, wow, that's so upsetting. All right, yeah. back to my day. <laughs> it's really disturbing. Yeah, it's really, really disturbing. The only one, I haven't seen The Monster which was one of their early it's releases. It's a dark one. Brian yeah. Bertino, wasn't it? Yeah, I've yeah. actually seen that. I want to check it out. I, in the trailer, I thought it looked great. I feel like that was one of the first things. Didn't we cover it here or something? Did, did, did you come on for that? I don't know. We did a review of that, I remember, really? a while back. That's yeah. funny. It, was, it like came out right around a, a horror film festival time, right? Yeah. I don't remember. I quite liked I it. I just said, yeah, for no reason <laughs> at all. <laughs> What's your favorite, Barry? I think I have to go with Green Room. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, was I love that movie. instantly at That's TIFF hard. when it premiered obsessed. Mm -hmm. It was one of those movies that it came out and then the second it hit theaters and then I was able to own it, I watched and rewatched and watched it again. What a great ensemble there. Yeah. And it's just like everything from the music to the atmosphere to certain side characters that when they're introduced they should mean absolutely nothing to you but they have a really important through line that affects the entire story. I think that movie is so so well done. I am a huge Jeremy Saulnier fan. Yeah, me too. Like I I came to that film late. I'd missed it when it was in theaters and I watched it at home um which is not my favorite way to see a movie i want to see but that was the way it panned out and uh yeah it was a real kind of just i could feel my jaw it was kind of lower <laughs> the whole time through watching it's it's also it's really smooth yeah the characters don't just make like dumb decisions either they kind of do things you might do in that, i have in those so much respect for that when it yeah. actually happens yeah. because it's it's very Shockingly, even though certain things are the natural things to do, I feel like when you're like, I even had this problem when I attempted to write horror myself, which I just don't do anymore because other people do way better than me. <laughs> but I feel like maybe because I've seen so much, my brain is naturally trained to sure. like the cliche, like have them go up the stairs when like oh. nobody would actually do that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, to yeah, shift it's a great that. Movie. <laughs> Funny, I was thinking of A24 Horror there. I'd kind of forgotten a little bit about Green Room. For That's why I was so like, good. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's great. Right. <laughs> it's really cool. it's a, it was like, feels weirdly prescient too like I, I went back and watched it later and I was like oh we do deal with Nazis more than we did when this came out <laughs> it's like yeah, it's true. fairly upsetting yeah. um, we always like to ask our guests this question as well not your movie but any other <laughs> horror related thing that you've experienced recently whether it is a movie a TV show book anything you could think of that you want to recommend to our viewership that they should be aware of what would it be and why wow okay I'm gonna have to think you're really putting me on the spot <laughs> here so something something in the horror space that I've seen or experienced yes. recently can it be real life um, do you we, know what it, actually, there is something there's certain things that scare me so there's without giving too much away there's like, well, you know the Elisa Lam story, the Cecil Hotel? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that was just put back on my radar in the last week or so. And I'd seen that video before in the past. And actually, I rewatched it. I was in Sundance. Um, and I sat down and I had a look at, uh, at that video again, just on my own. And like, 
that scared the shit out of me. I, I, I woke up like four times that night looking into the corner of the room. So although it's not a, a wild new recommendation, if you haven't looked at that piece mm-hmm. of video in quite some time, I would recommend going back and looking at it again on your own in the dark and challenge you to not be scared by it. You know, I think it's, there's just something, that's the height of the unknown, you know, when you watch something like that. And sure, it's probably explainable, but how it's presented really, really, really gets under my skin. No, that's Seriously. pretty accurate assessment of that yeah. clip. Do yeah. you guys know what's the status on someone trying to make a movie about that? I know, aren't there a couple people working on something? No comment. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some people Appropriate there. response. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember we've been talking about that for quite some time. Yeah. And wasn't a, was it American Horror Story where everyone was like, it was an influence and then it wasn't or something Hotel, like that? Maybe. Yeah, yeah that would make sense. Yeah, something like that. I just remember everybody saying it was inspired by that and then Ryan Murphy or someone came out and said, no, you guys are all wrong. He's like, nope, my show's insane. (laughs) I think the challenge with it is that what makes it so scary is is the unexplained. I think if you you attach too strong a myth to that, then you kind of actually remove the fear by explaining it. It's the fact that nobody knows, to me, is what makes it so scary. And even though I'd seen it before and then I look at it again, I was so unnerved. Like, I I wasn't sleeping particularly well as it was in Park City. But I was yeah, seriously looking into the corners of the room and not, not feeling good. It is very difficult to go away and sleep well in yeah. just like a foreign space. I think I'm on a total of maybe like 60 hours sleep in the last two and a half weeks or something. It's like it's not, it's not enough. <laughs> I think I was <laughs> sleeping something like four hours a night regularly there because it's like you would go to a midnight movie, you would get back at two o'clock, you would be asleep by three, and then you would be up at seven yeah. to have a full day in Park City. Of course, yeah. Those days are behind me. I'm an old lady <laughs> now. I need my sleep. Oh, that's the benefit of Fantastic Festival. Where yes. I feel like you start late and you go late. Well, this is something that made me realize I'm truly becoming an old lady. I was like, I don't want to go to the midnight screening. I'll go to the 7 a.m. one instead. Oh, wow, yeah, because I'll, yeah. be, I'll be up anyway tending yeah. to the cats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> tending to the cats. cats. Are you a cat fan? Oh, oh this, this is, is a problem. Here. Yeah, I had a feeling. <laughs> See, this is what happens the second you say, I mean, really cat or dog for that matter, yeah. but eventually yeah. like, we will perk up and want to know more. Our <laughs> animals come up at least every year. Yes, yes. I, I had a great cat that lives, she's like 24, 25. Wow. She, she did the rounds, like, yeah, she oh, stuck around. Oh boy. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And then she was found in the engine block of my mother's car eventually. She oh. went there to die. How grim is that? Oh, oh. my, <laughs> that is a sad story. <laughs> no, it's, it's a happy story, because 20, 25 life. is a yeah. really long A long, life. wonderful life. What was your cat's name? It was, I named her after Jessica Rabbit because I got her at the time I'd seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> so she was called Jessica Cat. Aww. Oh, man. Yeah, but we called her Jess, like Jess for short. But yeah, it was Jessica. Um, everyone knows out there, I have a Dewey named after Deputy Dewey. Excellent. It had, it had to be a movie name. He should, I say this all the time, he should be an Instagram star. He's a ridiculously cute and charming cat. I can barely maintain and my he's own got Instagram, the though. For it. I love that this cat thing wasn't primed at all. I didn't have any idea that using the word cat would change the. It's a whole direction. trigger in here. Yeah. yeah. Th- thankfully, you didn't do this at Sundance, but I feel like there were a couple people that came in and, uh, so, like, someone randomly said puppy or cat or something, and you would immediately see, like, my head tilt or something, <laughs> and the, con- the whole conversation would go completely <laughs> off the rails. Like uh, I said, it's part of the brand here. Of yeah, the, yeah, yes. of course. Welcome. Good to know. Yes. Given our discussion before and about the the clip that you brought up, I'm curious, what is your what is the horror movie out there that scared you the most? In my life. Yeah, yeah. I'd say in the as a grown up, it was Ringu, like the original Ring. Mm-hmm. That was probably the film that scared me the most. A grown up. Um, I think as a kid, The Shining. I can tell you my The Shining story. Let's want. hear it. Please, we love Shining so, Stories. So I saw it when I was about eight years old. I can remember it was a Friday on VHS. My older brothers and sisters had like rented it out. Sat down and watched the first half. Called for dinner. I remember, weirdly, it was spaghetti bolognese. I can remember this t- <laughs> because I've told this story so many times. And it was even what at the time. What is it, it with spaghetti? Story. I don't know. <laughs> Went back, watched it. Obviously, you know, like the hag in room 237 was scary. But overall, I was like, eh, that wasn't so scary. Went to bed that night and just something changed inside me. Like, it was just, like, the scariest thing ever. And I've, I've had this cycle since then. Whenever I get scared by a movie, it takes me about three nights to get over it. There seems to be... And I will, still as a grown-up, if I'm really scared. Like, when I saw Paranormal Activity, I slept with the lamp on that night. Hmm. First time I saw Paranormal Activity. I'm so but, happy you said that, because yeah. I feel like every time I mention that is one of the most recent movies to actually scare me. Yeah. It, it's a, I think it, it also was because when I first saw Paranormal Activity, it was before, like, the hype train, like, took right off, so nobody yeah. really knew what it was. And then I almost feel like it's a defense mechanism, too. Like, yeah. someone will get scared, but just to make themselves feel better about being scared, they're like, how did that scare you? Yeah, no, it is, it is a scary one, and it was like 
so back with The Shining and then what happened was I was scared for a few nights and freaking out and like ruining everyone's sleep in the house and my dad was away on business and he came back and it was like oh how's Lee because I was, you know, how's Lee been doing like he's been a pain in the ass like why well we showed him The Shining and he was like well that's your fault because <laughs> he's like eight but also <laughs> I haven't seen that since it was in theatres so he went and rented it again so I just got over my, my three day recovery oh I'm lying in bed at night and I start hearing the music, the iconic music from it again, and it reactivated me for another three nights. <laughs> but then about a year later, my dad came back again from business and he had, uh, he'd forgotten to leave his hotel room key in. And it hung in our, in our like hallway in our house that I grew up for years and it was room 237 he oh. forgot to hand back. What? Yeah. So that's my, that's my The Shining story. <laughs> I feel like I grew up dreaming of going to a hotel and staying in a room 237. Room 237, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably like not make that happen. Yeah, I mean, you would think. Cross that right well, off doesn't, the Well, doesn't the Overlook not have a room 237 or something like that? Like the real Overlook? I've never been there. I don't, but I don't know. And in the book, it's like it's room 217 in the book, right? Have I got that right? I think, it is, I think it is. It's, I know that the numbers are different and I believe you're right. It's 217. Yeah. And also just a shout out to the Blair Witch Project, which I still think is one of the most terrifying movies of all time. It and really it's a film I still slightly struggle to watch on my own. Also, The Exorcist, the first time I saw it, I was probably about 13, because it was hard to get your hands on in, in, in good old Catholic Ireland back in the day. <laughs> and then it was the re-release. I think it was maybe the, would it have been the 25th? No, it wouldn't be, there was a re-release anyway. So the first time I ever saw The Exorcist was lucky enough to like go to the cinema, go to oh, a multiplex nice. and watch it with a full house. And that, yeah, that's a scary movie. Ah, that makes scary. me jealous. I've never yeah. seen The Exorcist with a full theater. I haven't either. That yeah, it was awesome. Seems like a like a must do. Theater. Yeah, really, really cool. Huh. Really awesome. But yeah, Blair Witch, those shouts in the forest are very uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, that, that immediately brings me back to the, the shot I like in your movie of her running through the forest, where it's like you're just completely consumed by like the chaotic blackness there. Yeah, just a torch and just her breathing and that's it. It's fun, you know, like what hides in the shadows is always something that mm -hmm. you have a lot of fun with, you know. <laughs> oh, so you, you go first. Well, I'm just curious. You just named two of the iconic found footage movies as the ones that scare you. Is that a medium you would ever mm -hmm. want to work in? Just say it. Strange you ask that question because I'm also a This Is Spinal Tap fan, which ah. I know isn't a found footage <laughs> film. But when I started out in film school, I was only really interested in like mockumentary style comedy. I was a big fan of like The Office at the time, the UK version, mm -hmm. so I was really into that. And it was around similar time to like The Blair Witch, was, what, Blair Witch was 99, would that be right? 99. So I left school in 99 and started film school the following year. So would I, it would take a really fresh idea. Like I loved The Visit, that Shyamalan That's did. That's fun. I was That's like, a that, great one. It was yeah. great, like really, really great. So yeah, there's a few, is it, I don't think it's a medium I necessarily would be attracted to because I, I don't know, I kind of like the control of my own filmmaking approach and how I try and position the camera. But I would never say never. If it was the right idea, I'd be into it for sure. Have you seen Lake Mungo? No, I haven't, and I've heard it's great. That film terrifies me. I've heard it's really great, yeah. <laughs> terrifies me. This and actually it's, it's the mockumentary style, okay. like fake documentary. This piggybacks off of that question. Well, now that your first feature is semi out there, it's on direct TV and people can watch it right now. And, you know, you told me you were working on your Ghost Train feature in our last interview, but what is your mentality kind of going forward? Because your first feature is a big, big deal, but so is that sophomore effort. Yeah, of course, yeah. The, uh, the, is it the difficult second album or is it the difficult third album? I don't know, yeah, making, everybody's like, it's really hard to make your first movie and then you break through and everyone's like, it's even harder to make your second. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to get a little bit easier. Um, yeah, I, like I have a particular project that when we mentioned Box of Bones that I'm working on. I am mindful that I've been able to present my own voice and vision as a filmmaker, so it's likely that it would be something that I would self-generate, um, which I have a couple of projects kind of on the boil. And I think what I'm trying to do with my next feature is actually, to, for my money, make a really scary movie. Um, people have responded to The Hole in the Ground as something that frightens them. It's hard in your own work to see that when you're so close to it all the way through. I'm hoping to create one or two moments in Box of Bones that would leave me continually unnerved mm. no matter how many times I saw them. Um, and it's, I'm sticking in a similar thematic space. It's a, it's a story about a broken relationship and can you mend that and the horror that might come out of that situation between, you know, two lovers or two partners, you know, where can you go? And it's, it's, it's about a guy whose memory is, is fractured um, and his girl, after a near death car accident, his girlfriend is trying to remedy that and remind him of the man that he once was, but his attention is drawn towards the supernatural force that started to develop in his life following the discovery of a box of human remains. So I'm not going to say much more than that, but that's the road I'm going down. Interesting, yeah, interesting. That's the road I'm going down. 
So box of bones would be next and then yeah. can you can you tell our viewers what ghost train is because that is a short that people can google and watch yeah, right, right now yeah, yes so i highly it recommend it so ghost train is um a story about these two brothers and their friend and they go to this abandoned amusement park to try and ride this old ghost train and in the usual kiddie argument of like who goes first one of the kids gets sucked inside and never returns and it's a kind of a dual timeline story between that incident and also the two brothers that remained as men returning to that site and unpackaging the trauma and grief and maybe the guilt of whose fault it, it really was. So yeah, it's, a short, it's, 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 it's 15 minutes long. I think it's a pretty atmospheric short film and it delivers some scare as well. You know, it's got its moments um, and that's something that I'm, you know, the universe around that I'm developing into a, a bigger feature film uh, project, which is again, playing with the same idea of this missing kid inside a ghost train. Um, and also these brothers that are trying to figure out how it happened, but a bigger, wider story about a community and how people might behave when a child goes missing in potentially supernatural circumstances. There's something about amusement parks that always get me. Yeah. She loves them. Man. You pair an amusement park with the horror I genre, know, yeah. and yeah. So that's another thing. thing that all I all I need to hear is that combination, and I'm in. There was like a little, there was like a little shitty like amusement park where I grew up. I grew up in this small kind of like a seaside village in on the east coast of Ireland. So we had the the low, like, but our big wheel was like no taller than this set. You know what I mean? It's like this really small, but there was a ghost train uh, there and I, all, I was always scared to go in it. And I did a couple of times, but it was, you know, one of those really poor quality, just these like rubber effigies hanging off the wall and a guy with a hairy glove on that grabs your hair when you go through. <laughs> but it always stuck that, even just the title ghost train, I was like, I think there's a great story to tell around something, that kind of dark ride. How are you finding the process of uh, adapting your own short to a feature? Did you have like a feature in mind when you made the short or are you having to build that all now? I had a bigger story in mind and I don't know if it was a feature film. And then the response to the short was lots of people saying, I want to see more. And I was like, well, I really should actually have a think about this. And then I just had a eureka moment about how I wanted to do it. What the kind of, I'm not necessarily a twist guy, but I think if you have a mystery, you have to have a reveal. So I found what I wanted the reveal to be. And then it all kind of, it kind of hung from there. So when I finished The Hole in the Ground, I finished The Hole in the Ground on like something like the 2nd of June last year. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take a month off and relax. And, and I started writing Ghost Train the next day, which is probably the worst thing I could have done because I haven't had a break <laughs> since. Um, but yeah, I just sat down and trusted my instinct on the story a little bit and where I wanted to take it and what I wanted to do. And then I wrote an outrageously ambitious screenplay, which was like 170 pages long. I was like, is this like two movies or what am I trying to do here? <laughs> I've got it down and I'm getting closer all the time. Um, but there's a battle, I think when you're a, a dual timeline story, you, you battle about with pace and you also battle with tone a little bit. When I write kids stuff, or you know, I tend to lean into my kind of like Amblin roots, and you know, I'm a big Spielberg fan. You know, crafted a huge amount of my again my own influences, and the uh, that's the challenge right now. The kids in the story are maybe a little bit gee whiz bubblegum, and I'm trying to take them more into that stand by me space so that they can sit with the grown up story a little bit neater. So that's the work that I'm doing on it. Name dropping all the right things now. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. I practiced. Um, my family also has a dog named Gordy, so I'm a okay. big Stand By Me fan. Me too, me too. That's awesome. Um, what were some of your other influences, especially genre influences? Because I know you said you're a big Sam Raimi fan. Yeah, well, like Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, I saw for the first time on VHS in one night with my dad. Um, and the power actually sounds like such a joke. The power went out during Evil Dead 2 in our house there was a storm outside. It was like a cliche. As it should. Yeah, so I think like that that's a different tone, obviously, and that, again, has had a major influence on, on, I guess, just my thinking and how I approach things. And I think what I would take from Sam Raimi's work would be it's always good to have a little bit of levity in your horror. Even in The Hole in the Ground, it's kind of a dark story, but there are moments of levity and moments you let people breathe out. And there's a, a few, I'd like to say, attempts at jokes through the dialogue and things like that. So I kind of feel that, yeah, that, that side of things and the creativity as well talk about camera placement and finding different ways to tell a story. Um, and then like, you know, E.T. is just a huge film for me. Inner Space, there's one to remake, you know? Inner Space is a fantastic movie. That's a Bad good call. Batteries Not Included, <laughs> love that movie. Flight of the Navigator, you know, that sort of stuff was all, and yeah, Ghostbusters, I always forget to mention, like I still have all of my Ghostbusters toys and all my He-Man toys as well. <laughs> they're in a box, they're not on a shelf or anything like that, but they're there. Um, and Ghostbusters is like, yeah, the cartoon particularly was just, I was obsessed. 
I feel like if I go back to uh, New York to my family's house, I could probably find all of my Jurassic Park toys. Nice. Well, those I, those I, little I action about, figures that they used to have. Jurassic Park, actually. Yeah, like it's... <laughs> well, what were you describing? I think you were describing something with Jaws earlier, and I immediately got a flash, too. So I saw Jurassic Park when I was super, super young, and the image from that movie that always stuck in my mind and I kind of projected into my own bedroom was that shot of the raptor shadow moving across yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. the scene in the uh, w- when they're having their their dessert and I always used to put that raptor shadow in my childhood <laughs> room on the shades at night and I Aww. love I love that fe- I I miss having that feeling and paranormal activity was one of the first movies that gave me that feeling in a yeah. while where I would look out the uh, the door of my apartment and I would just expect like the bathroom light to yeah, come on you take it home you yeah. take it home with you I think that's what it's not always, it's interesting to say it's not always about horror it's just about those thrills or the terror or the tension and if you can take a little piece of that kind of home with you you know what I mean? It's like, like who in the, if, if, you know, if there was a small vibration here now in my water, you know, started to move, you're going to go right back to Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't take much for me go. to go right back yeah, to Jurassic yeah, true, Park. True. I, my thing was, and it's, I know dumb and I knew as a kid, but I was so afraid of sharks in the pool after Jaws. And that's yeah. so ridiculous. <laughs> I have a niece who's 17 that is terrified of sharks because of Jaws and my love of Jaws and constant talking about Jaws to her. <laughs> um, yeah, she, uh, she's pretty freaked out. Sharks are scary. They are. Sharks They're are not usually scary. in pools, but I yeah. guess it could happen. <laughs> you never know. You I guess so. There's a reboot where that could happen. Yeah. I feel like pool, pool shark or shark Shark, shark pool or something. It's probably yeah, on yeah. The sci-fi. Like yeah, I was gonna say ago. we're we're gonna get that if it hasn't already been made already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there any other? Uh, this is another yet again a big year for horror at the at the theater. So is there any upcoming horror movie that you're really looking forward to? I'm really interested to see Brightburn because it's 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 on the list around. You know, people are talking about the creepy kid movies that are out there. Mm. And the context of that sounds really interesting. I don't know if it's a horror per se. I haven't read a lot about it. I think it's genre bending. Yeah, yeah. I'll take I'll take that. So I'm I'm pretty looking forward to seeing that. Um, yeah, that's that's the one that stood out to me recently. I, just, I even like the title. I'm just really intrigued by what yeah. it might be. In truth, I it's really weird. And you're promoting your film, and the build up to all this, you get I get you get a little bit lost about what else is going on around you. I'm I'm actually a little bit lost on the day and the week that it is and. <sighs> I know where I am, but you know it's 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 kind of strange. So I've lost. I'm a big sports fan. I've lost all track of my sports teams. I've lost track of kind of everything. I think I have a family somewhere. I look uh-huh. forward to seeing them again. Um, so I'm kind of looking forward to just sitting down and and watching watching some stuff. You know. Not but sure before you do that, soak in every single of step of this journey because it is it's so well deserved. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. So what's the what's the next thing for you after you leave LA? You are off to Ireland for the premiere. Yeah. So we do the Irish premiere and then I just said premiere like an American. Oh my God. I'm changing. <laughs> premiere. Got that oh. nice flat Irish accent in there. <laughs> yeah. Off off to do the Irish premiere. Um and. Uh, a number of other kind of secret screenings and things that are happening. So some major cities in Ireland were also doing like, it's a secret film at one of the major cinema chains in Ireland. We'll be putting it out there as well. Um, and then equally, we've got the UK release as well, which is a fully theatrical release. It goes out on the same date. So there's some work to do over there. So I think I get back to Ireland on like the, what date's today? There you go. Today is the 6th. Today is the 6th. I get back to Ireland on the 9th. Yeah, I get back to Ireland on the 9th and I'll pretty much have another month of kind of promotional work and, and stuff to do around the film and interviews and all this fun stuff. But it's great. It's a sign that people are responding to the work. Yeah, yeah. Because if people didn't want to talk to you, <laughs> you know, maybe the film wasn't so good. Keep busy. Yeah, Have a blast. I will. Yeah. We're very, very happy for you. Yeah. And Thanks, guys. Cannot recommend The Hole in the Ground enough. It's available right now on DirecTV and in theaters in the States, March 1st. Lee, thank you so much Thanks for so your much. time really today. Was this great. was wonderful. Thanks um, for where can everybody find you on social media if they want to follow all your I'm work? I'm on Twitter only. I kind of I left Facebook and I left Instagram. There was just too much noise. So <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. It's Curly Cronin is my handle. Um, and that's like with an L-E-E as opposed to L-Y. Um, and also, I think I do recently have a new YouTube channel that has like Ghost Train up on it. I must put some of my other shorts up there. So you can check out Ghost Train online as well. And another Definitely thing I can't recommend enough. Yes. Um, Haley, where can everyone find your work? You can find me on Twitter at Haley Fouch and on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy. And I am on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Do share. Do tell everybody about the hole in the ground. That's it. We're done. You have officially survived the witching hour. Thank you.